and we're going to be talking about uh, taking Jericho. And our primary two chapters we're going to be looking at is Joshua chapter 2 and Joshua chapter 6. So if you would go ahead and turn to Joshua chapter 2, that's where we're going to begin. But some background here is we're fairly well, well aware of it. Um, the, the period of the wilderness wandering is coming to a close. It's ending. Uh, Moses has just died, and Joshua has now assumed the the role of Moses in taking the, the children of Israel into, into Canaan. So, and that's what we're going to pick up here in Joshua chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 5. This is a second time now an attempt to, to send spies into the land. We uh, already studied previously the first first attempt there in Numbers chapter 13 was the miserable failure and ultimately the, the reason why they're doing this again 40 years later. But picking up there in verse 1, it says, Now Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who, you, who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. And then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I, do, but I did not know where they, went, where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. So we see here that these two spies um, arrive at Rahab's house, and uh, she, she ends up hiding them there as, as word got out, I guess pretty quickly, that they were there spying out the land. And a question here, and I think we'll answer it in the next couple of verses, but why did Rahab receive these spies, and why, did, why, did she, why, why didn't she turn them over? She knew that these, these people of Israel were going to come take their city, but yet she received them and even uh, lied on their behalf to keep them safe. And we'll see the reason here in just a minute. Let's pick back up in verse 8, and I think we'll see the motive for her hiding these spies. Joshua 2 verse 8 says, now, now before they laid down, she came up to them on the roof. They were staying the night there. And, she, and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. There's the reason. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage among among. Sorry, neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token, and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. So, and we see here that the spies do make an agreement um, with Rahab on these terms, um, and they had some terms as well, and those were simply being that um, she didn't bring up this instance anymore. Um, she didn't go back to the king and say, yes, they were here, and here's all the rest of the details. She had to remain silent about this encounter. And then she also had to get all of her family gathered up and, and to bring them into her house and to keep them there. If they got out, during that time that they raided the city, they're, they're not going to be held accountable for killing them because they weren't in the house. And then also she was to mark her house, which was a house built into the city wall with a red ribbon so that they would be able to identify the house and to spare it when that time came. And uh, they both agreed to all these things and uh, it worked out well for her. And there's a typical question that m many people have here. Sometimes it could be maybe a um, someone almost looking for a loophole or something, but um, we see Rahab mentioned again in Hebrews 11, which we, we often call maybe the, the Hall of Fame of Faith. And she's a prostitute and she's a liar. And people may often use, use her lying in this situation to justify um, kind of situational ethics to it. Does the end justify the means? And they may refer to Rahab here and what she did in, in saving these two men. And use that maybe as a as an ex excuse to to lie in the right situation, 
And we'll look at that. And I, the, I believe the answer to that is, does the ends justify the means in this case? And the answer is no. <coughs> but consider a couple things about Rahab. Um, she was a heathen. She was from a heathen Nathan, nation. Nathan. It's my name. She was a prostitute. Um, she was not trained in the law of Moses. She, she knew nothing about God's law. She didn't have any moral guidelines of God's law in the forefront of her mind. And that's not saying that she didn't know lying was wrong. We all have an innate conscience and we understand morality. She knew it was wrong to lie, but that was not um, that wasn't on the forefront of her mind violating God's law here. That was not her priority. Um, the spies didn't prompt her to lie. And she did this of her own accord. It, it was simply her natural response to the situation. And it doesn't make it right. And it's, it's not the reason that we see her in, in Hebrews 11. If you would go ahead and turn there, we'll read that. Hebrews 11, verses 30 through 31. There it says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab the harlot did not perish with those who did not believe when she, had when she had received the spies with peace. I'll read 31 again. By faith, Rahab the har By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. So Rahab was, she was never, it didn't say by faith Rahab lied and hid the spies. That's not what it said. Um, she was never exonerated for lying. She was exonerated for having faith that in belief and trust that what she had heard and what she had seen, the evidences of the children of Israel and the evidence that God was with them and the miracles that He had worked, she knew that that was God that was, and that was going to happen to them. And because of that, she was willing to act on it. Um, she understood from what she had heard about God and the Israelites that this was going to happen, and that only a true and mighty God could do the works that He did. And uh, this was simply, she understood that the land was going to be taken from them, and that was simply because God was with them. And it didn't really matter what she did or didn't do. It was, it was a done deal. And that's why she was able to, to act on that knowledge and to have faith that that was going to happen. And ultimately, that's how she saved herself and her family. So now let's, come, let's uh, go back to Joshua 2, pick up verses 23 through 24. This is kind of the conclusion of the spies here. Uh, when they return there it says so the two men returned descending from the mountain and crossed over and they came to joshua the son of nun and told him all that had befallen them and they said to joshua truly the lord has delivered all of uh, truly the lord has delivered all the land into our hands for indeed the inhabitants of the country are faint-hearted because of us so unlike the first spying in numbers 13 um the spies come back with a good report, both of them. You know, the first time, 10 out of 12 had a very poor report and were uh, just terrified of this, this people. But this time, the two that were sent come back and they said, we've got this. The people are, are cowering at us now. They, they, have a, they have a fear of what's coming on them and we, we've got it. And uh, Joshua, for the second time, first as a spy and now as the leader leader of Israel is given the news and he and he knows it that it's definitely time um, and the time is going this time going in there's not fear um, there's only confidence and evidence of God's fear upon the people in it in Jericho and they're they're ready to move this time so now uh, that was the end of chapter 2 just to kind of summarize quickly uh, chapters 3 through 5 I'm not going to read any significant amount of that but anyway, the children of Israel cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan in chapter 3. And they do this miraculously. They actually, God stops the flow of the, the Jordan River there for a significant amount of time and basically just walls up water on the upstream and the whole nation crosses the river on dry ground. And they go ahead and actually set up a memorial there of 12 stones. They have 12 elders from the one from each tribe pick up a big chunk rock out of the river and they pile them up on the bank on dry ground so that they could always remember that that crossing there when God held the waters for them. And they also kept the Passover in the spring. It was the springtime here. They keep the Passover. And they also ate of the produce of the, the plains of Jericho, it says there. And actually from that time forward, um, they, they stopped receiving manna. 
They no longer got bread from heaven. They no, no longer went out every morning and received their daily portion of manna. From that time forward, they ate from the fruit of the land. And we can see that's evidence still that the, the promise is fulfilling. And the time to, to take Jericho has come. And that's where we'll pick up. Uh, I start here at Joshua 5, verse 13. I think this should actually have probably been maybe the start of chapter 6. Uh, the way this chapter breaks up, I think it makes it a little more difficult to understand what's going on here. But we'll start at Joshua 5, verse 13. It says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped, and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. So like I said, I think verse 13 should be really the start of chapter 6. And this will flow a little better that way. But anyway, um, there are various opinions about this, who this commander of the army of the Lord was. Was it an angel or was it uh, God appearing to, to him here? And uh, I believe it was God appearing to him. Um, what this is, uh, what Bible uh, scholars call this kind of situation is a theophany. And that is uh, is the combination of two Greek compounds, theos meaning God and phanon meaning to appear. Thus, a theophany then is an, ex an appearance of God to human beings. And that was a definition I just copied from BibleStudyTools.com to give that credit. Uh, Y'all knew I didn't make that up. So other examples of that, um, you know, when the when the men come and visit visit Lot, that was another situation like that when uh, Abraham was visited to be told of, his, um, of their son to be born and other situations. And also one with very similar wording here is where God directly approaches Moses at the burning bush in, in uh, Exodus chapter 3, um, where he appears to Moses in Exodus 3 verse 5, God says to Moses, do not draw near to this place. And he quotes the same exact phrase here, take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground and that's not because that geographical gps coordinate and the one they're at now are, are two similar coordinates and both of those two little places are holy ground it's because god was in his presence that's why it, and that's also just more evidence for the fact that this was god appearing appearing to joshua and it's also evidenced by the fact that joshua fell down and worshiped worshiped him and called him lord and uh, we can see in other situations in Revelations, we can see where, where, where John fell down to worship an angel and he was rebuked for it. In this case, Joshua was not rebuked. This was clearly God appearing. And this was God manifest, manifesting himself to Joshua in, in human form. So now let's uh, continue on. Uh, now, as I said, this is the same context as where we just stopped. Let's pick up at verse 1 of chapter 6. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city. All, your, all you men of war, you shall go around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast of the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, and then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. So God lays out here the plan to Joshua. Day one was to get, the sev get seven priests, the Ark, of the, the Ark of the Covenant, and all of the men of the military, and they were to march around the city one time. Day two... Day three, day four, day five, day six, the same thing. They were to march around the city once and stop for the day. And then the seventh day had to be the long day. They marched around the city seven times. And then at the end of that seven times, the priests were to blow those ram's horns. And at, all at once, the entire army was to just let out a, a 
a crazy shout and then the wall was going to fall down flat. If we tried that out here, it wouldn't work, guarantee you. And it's nothing to do with sound waves and vibration and harmonic frequencies or anything like that. It was the power of God. And Joshua receives this instruction and prepares the people. But think back. What if this was the 40-year-ago people and they got this, this uh, plan? What would they have done? <laughs> William's laughing. Um, they, would, they wouldn't have done it, I guarantee you. They would, have, they would have ridiculed it. They would have whined. They would have complained. And they would have begged to go back to Egypt or just be killed there on the spot. But that's not the case with these people. Um, they accepted the plan. They executed exactly as, direct, as they were directed. Because I believe they had come to the realization now that it wasn't of themselves. It was not their ability. It was not their might that was going to get them this land. But it, they were going to take this city by God's power, not of their own power. And they were beginning to finally build that faith and have that realization that it wasn't them. It was God. And they were simply going to follow his direction and they would trust that the outcome would come out. And, but one thing this, this plan did, it, maybe it did seem illogical, um, but in one, one way I don't think it was. Ultimately, I, I, I do believe it was a test of their faith. If they didn't do it, of course, God was not going to do his part in taking down the wall. And it was a test of their faith. But another thing it was, mer well, military-wise, was uh, just an act of psychological teardown of your enemy. Just imagine that you're in that city on, up on this big 50 foot wall. You're watching them day in and day out, knowing they're going to make that attack. Day one, they come around. You're, you're waiting on them. You're, you're kind of ready for them. You're nervous. Nothing happens. Day two, same thing. You know that at day seven, man, they had to be just, just ready to be killed. I don't know. But it had to be a, a terrible mental attack on, on that when you really think about that. Uh, they knew that this was going to happen. You know, that all they could do was watch and worry and not know when it was going to happen. And it really had to be very mentally exhausting on the seventh day by the time that they did attack. These people had probably no, they probably had no way to, no way to move, no way to think. They were just sitting ducks at that point. So let's, let's go now read the execution of the plan. You can see that clearly executed starting there. Uh, Joshua 6 verse 15. There it says, But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about, about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened when the priests blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall, shall live, she and all who are in her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become a curse when you take, take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel and a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord, they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted with the priests when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the, when the people heard the sound of the trumpet that the people shouted with a great shout and the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took, and they took the city and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. So I'll ask again, what, what brought down the wall it wasn't it wasn't the it wasn't the scream that had to be a very loud loud noise but it wasn't sound waves that brought that down it was their faith and god doing his part when they when they did theirs so really imagine the terror of these people as they first hear the trumpet then a roar you know louder than anything they've ever heard um those of us who've been to a really big sporting event maybe you've been to neyland stadium watched a football game you can imagine you kind of get, maybe you get a feel for, you know, what a really loud roar of people is. And I would, I would suspect that it's probably a lot louder than what you'd ever hear here at Neyland, which is, it's, make your ears hurt. Um, it's very loud, but that might be 80 or 90,000 people screaming. There might be 100,000 people in there, but they're not all screaming. But this army, every one of them letting out the shout of their life, that had to be a terrifying noise. 
And then on top of that, as soon as that was finished, their walls just fell down. And these walls were, uh, I was, did some research on it. And it, this is an archeological site to this day. And it, it affirms everything that the Bible says. Um, if you do some research on the, um, it's actually a, basically a tourist area to this day, the city of Jericho is. And uh, you could see that um, these walls were estimated based off the archeological digs to be made of about six foot wide of red, uh, red, red clay bricks. And they were estimated to be about 50 foot tall. It had an outer wall, which was, came up to about 40, 50 foot. And then an interior filled with dirt that they actually built houses on all around. And then an interior wall matching the exterior wall. So it's a very significant structure. And to have all of that just fall out. And that was the only way the people were actually able to go up into the city because it's on a hill. And they couldn't just, they couldn't go up there if they wanted and the wall kept them out. So when that wall fell down, it acted as a natural, natural ramp for them just to charge the city. I thought that was pretty interesting. But God's, excuse me, God's judgment had come to this wicked people and it had to be terrifying. Now let's look at the account of uh, saving Rahab. Not saving Private Ryan, but saving Rahab. Joshua 6, verse 22. There it says, But Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, and from there bring out the, two, bring out the woman and all that she has, as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside of the camp of Israel. But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire, only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her, father, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out the land. So we can see for Rahab, her faith did save her her belief that this was going to happen and her willingness to, to help the men of Israel um, saved her entire family. And to that day, she, she was able to assimilate into Israel and to, to live the rest of her life as an Israelite. Now let's look at the last two verses of the chapter. This is just, a, in my opinion, just a really interesting uh, prophecy here. And we'll see its fulfillment. Joshua 6, verse 26 says, Then Joshua charged them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord, who rises up and builds this city Jericho. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn, and with his youngest he shall set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout all the country. So after setting fire to the city, destroying it, Joshua sets a curse, curse on it, and the penalty for it being rebuilt was this, that the man who set its uh, foundation to build it back would lose his firstborn son, and uh, in setting its final gates would, would lose its, his youngest. And we actually see this fulfilled some hundreds of years later during the reign of King Ahab in Israel. We can see that First 1 Kings 16, verse 34. In his days, that's talking about Ahab, in King Ahab's day, Heel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation with Abram, his firstborn, and with his youngest son, Segub, he set up its gates according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through, this, through Joshua, the son of Nun. And at this time, Israel was very wicked, very evil. They were an idolatrous nation at this point. Their king was, I think, probably the most evil king they ever had at that time. And the whole nation was just given to idolatry. And more, more than likely, that they'd probably even forgot this, this word of Joshua, that that would even come to pass. Uh, whether it was through ignorance or disbelief, one, this man set out to, to build the city, back, to build back Jericho, and it ended up costing him his, his firstborn and his lastborn sons. I thought that was just interesting. So just to conclude here, the, we'll basically be winding up our study here. The, uh, the land conquest has begun. The promise is being fulfilled now. We see evidence of it here in taking Jericho. Um, it's taken a number of years. It's been well over 500 years since the original promise to Abraham. It's been a long time coming, but it is coming. 
and it's finally being realized. And also that Israel was successful in taking Jericho. And, and uh, what was different there between this time and the original attempt there in Numbers 13? And it's the fact that the people trusted in God. Previously, they accused God of bringing them out there to be, only be killed, killed and to have their women and children killed by the Canaanites. That was their accusation against God the first time. But this time was different. There wasn't any complaining. Uh, they showed great faith and they had obedience to God's plan. And because of that, they were very successful. And uh, just kind of an application, two points here, and that's we've kind of already mentioned it, but God keeps His promises. It might not be on our timetables. It may not be in our foreseeable future. But what He says will happen, will happen. And also when we stick to God's plan, we're going to be successful. And to summarize this, I'd like to, I know it's kind of a lengthy reading, but if you would turn to Second Peter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 through 14. I think this is very uh, fitting of these two points here to, to, to make a summary. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. We'll read this and we'll, we'll conclude here. There it says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of, uh, and the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the... For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were, were of old, and the earth standing out of water and, wa and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men." But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and all and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, for that reason, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens <coughs> will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, we look, <coughs> excuse me, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace without spot and blameless. So you can have confidence in knowing what God has said is going, going to take place. And His timetable is not ours. And with those two things being in mind, knowing what He says is going to take place, knowing, knowing that what we read here, the end of the world is coming, His judgment is coming on us. What more could we be doing than to be, to be ready all the time, to be prepared knowing that this world could end at any given minute, and where do we want to find ourselves here? Knowing this should motivate us to always be ready, always be working, and always to be uh, remembering God's promises and knowing His faithfulness to, to fulfill them. So That's all I have for us this evening. I hope the study's been beneficial. certainly wouldn't want to close the service without extend, <coughs> extending the invitation. Maybe your, your faithfulness is running dry. Maybe you're... Sometimes we, we get in, in a rut in, in the fact that we, we look on God's promises and we're thinking on them on our, on our timetable and, and things aren't going the way you think and you begin to lose faith. If, if you're struggling like that, we need to make that right. If you need the prayers of the church or if you would simply would desire to obey the gospel, we give you the opportunity while we stand and sing.